Radio Now 100.9's Indie Connection with Emily Matheny. Hello, I'm Emily Matheny, your host. This week, I had the chance to sit down and talk with Mallory Duncan of INDOT ahead of some major traveling this winter and this holiday season. She gave us some details about the projects that are currently being wrapped up, what's coming up in the new year, and how INDOT works with city departments of public works. Mallory, can you tell us a little bit about what you do in your position with INDOT? Sure. I'm the communications director in the Greenfield District. So INDOT has a number of districts around the state. Um, The Greenfield District... It includes, or the East Central District, you'll see it both ways, Uh, it includes Marion County and out uh, east, all the way to the Ohio border, all the way up um, Muncie, Kokomo, all those places up there, and then down along the 74 line, just past Shelbyville. So I have a very large area. Yeah. we're all over the place, and it includes all of Marion County, so it kind of juts out around Indianapolis and 465. Excellent. And so that's the service area for NDOT, and um, when it comes to NDOT, like, that's the reach, that's the area you service, correct? Um, just just our district, but obviously we service the entire state of Indiana. Every single Hoosier is touched by NDOT. Um, we try to keep the road safe for, for all of them. And what are some of the projects you're currently working on? So we are finishing up our um, Marion County Winter Damage Maintenance Plan, and we've executed this all over the state. Um, Obviously, a lot of Hoosiers will have noticed that we did just a teeny bit of construction this year, Um, mostly, you know, in Marion County and on 465, 70, 65, Mm -hmm. 865, basically within the 465 loop. Uh, We did a lot, a lot of work, most work in Marion County we've done since we built the interstate. So um, thank you for your patience with that. We are wrapping up. We are a couple weeks away. Uh, I know it's getting colder, but we are doing work that can be done in the cold. Um, We have obviously planned it that way. So Mm -hmm. um, we're finishing up and and we will see a long-term benefit and a short-term. Short-term will be this winter. You won't be driving in a bunch of potholes. Yay! Right, which is very exciting for a lot of people. So Thank you for your patience and for bearing with us. I think the payoff will be come February, come March, when we usually see those potholes open up, we won't see as many. Excellent. And speaking of next spring, already looking ahead, what projects do you have for next summer, like spring, summer year? So there are some things that are obviously still being planned out. That's our Mm -hmm. construction season. Our construction season usually starts April, May, when we get that warm weather in Indiana. You never really know. (laughs) Could be March. (laughs) So um, whenever we can start, we obviously have uh, I-69 coming Mm -hmm. in. So we're getting closer and closer to Marion County and into um, that east central region of NDOT. And a lot of stuff will be going on with that. You'll see some demolition of trees, of different things around uh, Marion County. We have some little projects out, you know, on 31. Um, We're starting some things on local roads and um, obviously we have partnerships with cities to do local projects as well. So a lot going on already planned. We plan every five years. Uh, That's usually how far out we're we're starting to plan. So excellent. And kind of touching on the city side. So NDOT does work directly with the cities that it's working with. We do. So we work with cities, uh, for instance, this summer, we worked a lot with DPW about um, projects they're doing. So we are in the way. How can we alleviate some of these traffic issues on city streets? INDOT does not cover city streets. Um, That's an important thing to note. But we do work with every city that we go through that we're um, changing something. Let's say a state road goes through their town or their Mm -hmm. city. Um, Obviously, we work with them to find out what they want, what we can do, and okay. uh, make it a, a good relationship for both of us. I've always wondered how it connects. So, okay, that's excellent to yeah. know. And so, unfortunately, thinking back to winter, which is here. It's coming up, yep. So what are some winter safety traveling tips for the highways? Yeah, so the big thing is when it's snowing, when there's a chance of snow, um, look out for our plow trucks. They're hard to miss. They're huge. They're yellow. Uh, and they have a plow on them. <laughs> and so you can't miss them, but give them some space. Uh, we've been talking, you know, the past month, ever since we got our surprise for snow mm-hmm. in October, um, to give them some space. Uh, the safest place to be 
Nero plow is behind it mm-hmm. um, and give us about 50 to 100 feet more is better um, you don't want things flying off the truck like salt hitting the ground and then popping up on your car so the more space you can give them the better we also don't want you to go around them on shoulders you never know how much snow is going to be there if there's ice there um, and it could really endanger you your passengers and also the pilot drivers as well so give them space um, pass safely when you can uh, be aware of the amount of time and distance it'll take to pass that truck safely um, and let them do their job let them clear the roads and, and make the drive safer for everyone excellent and just out of curiosity when it comes for the plows to be out what's usually the rule of thumb when they end up going out how much snow is there usually Um, There is no rule of thumb. If there's something on the road or something coming, we want to get that off. We want that to be safe for drivers. Our our goal is perfectly clear, um, dry pavement. That is the best condition in winter. Even though it's cold, we don't want anything on there. So we're constantly looking at the weather. We're looking at, right now, chances of frost. We have uh, um, our trucks going out and brining the overpasses, the bridge decks, those are the things that are freezing um, faster and uh, we're constantly monitoring pavement temperature. So you may think that there's nothing on the road, um, but if you see brine or if you see salt, that means something's coming and we are trying to get the roads ready. So there could be plow trucks when it's perfectly sunny on a random Tuesday, but that's (laughs) just because we're getting ready for something coming and we want those roads to be clear. And if someone wants to stay up to date with road conditions, what's going on? Where's the best ways to find that? So there are a number of different ways where you can stay up to date. Um, If you follow us on social media, let's say you live in Indianapolis or in that area I talked about earlier, so Mm -hmm. east to the Ohio line. Uh, Follow us on Twitter, in.eastcentral, or in.east would be um, the Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's where you can find up to date information about how many trucks we have out, what we're doing, and kind of what we're looking at. Uh, On Facebook, it's in.eastcentral, so you can just search that as well. Um, But also, we have our in.dot traffic uh, program online. It's called CARS, so if you literally search (laughs) in.dot CARS, Uh, on Google, that'll pop right up. That'll show you traffic conditions, um, road conditions. You can look at pavement temperatures, things like that, in case you're really interested in pavement temperatures. So um, a rule of thumb for pavement temperatures also to think about is that's something we really focus on because it tells us when things could freeze on the road. And obviously, like I said, those bridge decks, those overpasses will freeze a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's what we're focused on. So even if it's, you know, 35 degrees outside, maybe the road temperature is way higher because it's been warmer Mm -hmm. or the road temperature could be way colder. So that is something also to think about. That's what we're looking at all winter long. Okay. So even if I see the random plow trucks out at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday and it's Mm -hmm. sunny, Yes. You're watching those road temperatures, making sure that it still stays completely safe and drivable. Yes, correct. And looking to see, you know, what can we put down uh, that will help clear the roads the quickest. I've never heard of this until I came closer to Indianapolis. What is the Hoosier Helper? So our Hoosier Helper is um, sponsored by State Farm, and they are great. They have their huge trucks out there. They have everything in that truck you could ever need to keep you safe in your vehicle. Um, And we could take a couple hints from them. You know, we're coming into winter. Maybe you need a couple tools in your car. Maybe you need um, a gas can, a blanket, a flashlight, things that you would really need if you were stuck on the side of the road, especially in um, cold Indiana temperatures during the winter. So they have everything in that vehicle. Vehicle. When you see that vehicle, um, you're also required to get over. So if they're on the side of the road helping someone out, change lanes, get over when it's safe, give them some room to really help out a fellow Hoosier. Excellent. And what's the number to call the Hoosier Helper? So the number to call the Hoosier Helper is the same if you see something on the roadway, if you need something um, with not at all. It's our customer service number. And the easiest way to remember it is 855-INDOT-4, the number four, the letter U. So 855-INDOT-4, or letter four, number four, <laughs> letter U. <laughs> um, and those numbers are equate to 855-463-6848. So those um, that can really help you out, or you can go to in.4u.com and you can fill out a request there. Excellent. And is there anything, oh, one more thing with the Hoosier Helper. What can they help with? 
So they can help with a lot of different things um, from changing a tire to maybe you need a little gas to get you, you know, where you're going um, if you run out on the side of the road. And also they, they are there for safety if an officer needs to come. Um, they have lights on their vehicle. They have everything that can keep you safe while you're there. And hopefully people will give you space as well. Excellent. And then those are my big questions. Is there anything else that I'm missing that you would like to touch on? I don't think so. Just, you know, stay safe on the roads this winter. Um, drive slow. We always say that, you know, drive slow in construction, drive slow in the winter, but it truly does save lives. So uh, give us space to plow the roads and make them as safe as possible for everyone. Um, and if you do need something, use that dot for you number. Um, we'd be happy to, to talk with you and, and help you out. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. You can follow road updates and conditions on Twitter at in.east and on Facebook at East Central. The customer service line and Hoosier Helper line is the same at 855 in. the number 4 U. Back in September, I spoke with David Berman from Mental Health America of Indiana as part of Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. We talked about how to ask someone if they're considering suicide, where they can find resources, and much more. My name is David Berman. I'm with Mental Health America of Indiana. Uh, We are one of the oldest mental health and addiction not-for-profits in the state. Um, We focus on advocacy and policy and direct services for all individuals in Indiana that are affected by mental health and substance use disorders. What are some of the statistics Mm -hmm. in all of this? Because we can just to put a number with it. So our most recent statistics, um, both in the U.S. and Indiana, are 2017 numbers. We know in 2017, um, almost 47,200 individuals in the United States died by suicide. Um, Every 30 seconds, every 30 seconds of every day, someone attempts suicide. Every 30 seconds. In Indiana, um, same numbers, 2017, um, or same year, 2017, 1,092 individuals died by suicide. Um, And that is one every eight hours in Indiana. Um, Suicide is the third leading cause of death for individuals 15 to 54. That is the bulk of our lifetime, the bulk of our lifetime. And when we go a little bit earlier, um, 12, 13, 14. Those are the formidable years where most mental health disorders really start rearing their ugly head as far as symptoms go. Um, The serious ones that typically lead to suicide because of the chemical changes, because of puberty. And so that 12, 13, 14 year old is, is as important, you know, when we think of statistics because of the vulnerability as anything else. But third leading cause of death, 15 to 54 year olds. It is the 10th leading cause of death overall for all ages. Homicide is the 16th leading cause of death. Yet we talk about homicide all the time, but the chances of us dying by suicide versus homicide are astronomically higher. But a big part of suicide is the mental health and right. the stigma around it. Can you tell us a little bit about the stigma? So, um, you know, talking about suicide, we know that 90% of individuals that die by suicide have some sort of mental health disorder or substance use disorder or both. Um, so we know that mental health issues are um, the impetus to suicide more often than not. The problem is that stigma is probably the biggest barrier for people accessing help, whether they're thinking about suicide or whether they are depressed or whether there's something going on in their life that just doesn't feel right. Um, And the stigma related to communities and demographics um, of uh, people of color is even greater than in all other communities. It's just not talked about. 
people do not access care. They don't discuss how they're feeling. The, um, the thought is to just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Or I've even heard that, hey, we don't want this to be something associated with our family. So we don't want people to know that you know, our family has problems. So we just expect you to just keep your mouth shut and don't talk about it at all. And so people are li- literally living in hell. Um, they're living a life of misery, of being depressed, of um, all sorts of, uh, of potential effects of how they're feeling and what they're going through and never seeking help at all. And what are some of the ways we can start breaking that sig- uh, stigma? Because I just went through some training with you and one of the things I did write down was we need to validate people as human beings. Sure. Um, Well, let me start by saying one of the biggest ways we can start eradicating stigma is through language. Um, Language hurts. Language defines. Language is based on stereotypes, um, not necessarily fact. For example, we don't say committed suicide. We say died by suicide or even killed themselves. The word committed has a negative connotation. People commit Mm -hmm. crimes or they're committed to a psychiatric facility. Um, And so we don't use that word. Uh, We try not to even say that someone is bipolar or someone has schizophrenia. Someone is not cancer. um, Or I'm sorry, has, we, we would say, someone is not cancer. Someone is not diabetes. Therefore, why should they be bipolar or why should they be suicidal? They're feeling that. They've been diagnosed with. Uh, they have a diagnosis of. So stigma is, is definitely uh, perpetuated through language. Another way is, as you said, by ensuring that we do not define ourselves through what it is that we have or who we are um, in our careers or in whatever it is that we're doing. We're people. We're all people. Just because we're a firefighter or a doctor or a lawyer doesn't mean that's who we are. We're also husbands and wives and parents and brothers and sisters and spouses. Um, And that's how we have to look at ourselves, that we have a lot of things in our life that are uh, worth living for. We have a lot going on for us above and beyond just the situational thing, whether it be a career or whatever it may be going on in our lives. So to change the language, what is the best way for me to approach someone and ask how they are, how they are doing? If I notice that they seem a little, they're acting differently. What is, what's a way that I can start that conversation? I think you just did. Hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, What's going on in your life? Suicide prevention, from this perspective, is not rocket science. It's just being decent, caring human beings that take the time to engage with the people around us, that pay attention, that notice what's going on. And and the way that you said that is exactly how you should. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, I've noticed that you just haven't seemed like you're yourself lately. Is there something going on? You know, I care about you. I'm here to talk. Mm -hmm. Let's sit down and and have a conversation. Um, We walk down the hall every single day in our offices, in schools, down the street, and we see people we know, we see people we don't know, and we say, hey, how are you doing? And we keep walking. Mm -hmm. And we don't stop because, frankly, we don't care how you're doing. And if you tell us, our heads spin because we don't know what to do. Again, not rocket science, just caring, taking the time to listen and engaging people. If I was walking down the hallway and I ran into you and I said, we were talking, it's like, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm not doing too well, but I'll be fine. Should I just leave it at that or should should we start that conversation? That Absolutely should be start the conversation. Hey, I hear you're not doing well. Um, what's going on? And then if it's, um, well, you know, um, my... Uh, my son has a horrible uh, uh, case of the flu, and work is just ridiculously stressful, and I have to take the dog to the vet, and blah, 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 blah. But hey, you know, going to get through it, be fine. Awesome. You know, mm-hmm. thanks for, you know, for sharing with me. I'm glad, you know, everything's going to be okay. If you need something, let me know. Or it may be something more serious. Um, 
and then we talk about it. Uh, but absolutely. Um, and I think, as I, I said in the training earlier, I believe that the best tool that we have is our gut instinct and our intuition. If something doesn't feel right, if someone says, hey, I'm going to be fine, or hey, I'm doing fine, and you feel like something is off, have the conversation. Continue to engage them. You know, you just seem off. Something mm-hmm. doesn't seem right. I care. Let's sit down and talk about it. And if someone just keeps going, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, is it okay to keep going back to that, kind of following up? Is that okay to do? Or So our relationships with people really drive how we approach them, I think in all things, but specifically this. If it's someone that you have a close personal relationship with or it's a family member, you handle it however you want to. Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you want to say, you know, I know (laughs) you're not okay, so sit down and let's talk about it. I mean, that's maybe the way you're going to handle it with someone close. Um, But it's really all relationship driven. However, at the end of the day, we can't force anybody to talk to us. We can't force anybody to get help. We can be a listening ear. We can care. We can stand by their side. We can follow up. We can engage them, but we can't force anybody to do Mm -hmm. anything. And so going back to the intuition, I would say based on your relationship and your intuition and how you think they'll respond, you handle it however you think is going to be best. Can I have you give a little bit of an explanation for anyone who's not familiar with QPR training? So QPR stands for question, persuade, and refer. And it is a evidence-based training. It is the most widely used gatekeeper training, which basically just means that it is a training for people that are that first point of contact with someone that is thinking about suicide. And it teaches how to ask the question, how to persuade someone to stay alive until they can get some help, and then how to refer them to whoever is going to offer help. Um, Evidence-based, but really boils down to being a decent, caring, engaging human being, as I said earlier. So with QPR training, is that something um, an ordinary, everyday Hoosier can do? So I get that question asked of me a lot, actually. Um, And I do a lot of trainings for lots of demographics, for teachers and for law enforcement professionals and first responders um, and even for mental health professionals. But I often get asked by people that are just average individuals, hey, you know, would QPR be something good for me, for my family, you know, in my workplace? And my answer typically is it really boils down to one question. Do you know people? If you know people at all, then yes, (laughs) QPR is a great training for you. Suicide prevention is everyone's responsibility. We all know somebody, whether we know we do or not, we all know somebody that has seriously contemplated suicide, maybe even attempted before. And it may be a coworker, it may be a friend, it may be our kid. And so absolutely, QPR is applicable for everyone in any circumstance. So, um, so one of the best places that's a repository of resources is the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, which is www.sprc.org. And they have a listing of all resources, national, text, uh, apps, uh, hotline calls, um, online resources, as well as segmented within the state. Um, state of Indiana, um, IN.gov, uh, and if you just get on the main site, you can find through Division of Mental Health and Addiction. They have a listing of all the community resource, men, uh, the community mental health centers in the state, as well as suicide prevention resources. And there's soon to be a brand new, really cool interactive website um, that is hosted by the Indiana Suicide Prevention Network, which is a subsidiary of Mental Health America of Indiana, that will have a listing of all resources, all trainings for suicide prevention and mental health trainings in the state, as well as a really cool online tool that will allow individuals and communities and places of business and educational institutions to create their own suicide prevention plans based on their own needs, their own demographics, 
Um, and that is about to be rolled out within the next two weeks or so. So to kind of close out, what we can do as people are be compassionate people, be de- decent people, ask how someone's doing and take the time to actually ask and listen. And let me also say if, you know, if it's suicide we're talking about or suicide that we're suspecting, be direct. Don't beat around the bush. Are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? It is not something that's comfortable for most people. We are not used to asking those questions. We are not used to looking someone in the eyes and saying, are you thinking about killing yourself? But we need to. We need to be compassionate. We need to be caring. We need to engage. But we also need to be direct um, because people think about suicide in very different ways. Those that are thinking about killing themselves aren't thinking that they're going to hurt themselves. They're not thinking that they're going to do harm to themselves. Suicide is about pain. It is not about wanting to die. It's about wanting that pain to end. And if you're ending pain, that's not harming yourself. So we want to be direct. Um, And if we suspect that someone is thinking about suicide, We want to be persistent, we want to engage them, and we want to get a direct answer. As a reminder, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-TALK. The text number is 741-741. You can also find additional resources at sprc.org. Thank you for listening. Please join me again next week. And if you have any questions or comments, please email me at emetheny, that's E-M-E-T-H-E-N-Y at radio-one.com. Until then, have a great week. Radio Now 100.9's Indie Connection with Emily Matheny.